Rest in peace, Orlando Cepeda. This has been a sad couple of weeks for San Francisco Giants fans. You are Locked On MLB, your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, let me show you. They gave me a lower third. I can be called Sully. I've been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and this is my sixth full season here as a member of the Lockdown Podcast Network. And this year, I am doing double duty because I am not only the host of Lockdown MLB, but I'm also hosting Lockdown A's, as the A's have been, well, it's been rough. Not going to lie to you. And it's been a rough year. This has been a rough year for Bay Area fans, no matter what. We know the A's are going to leave. At the end of the year, and we also know that the Giants have lost two of their great legends. Follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. I am your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And today's episode of Locked On MLB is brought to you by our good friends at Tax Network USA. Did you know that it's never too late to resolve your tax issues with the IRS? Don't wait. Reduce your tax debt and get help from a team of licensed tax professionals. Call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me quickly just go through uh, the trivia question. A couple of you got it right. Uh, I'm going to call out because I'm tired of crediting Scott Horsmeyer. Um, uh, John Cox got the question right, which was in 1988, when the Dodgers won the World Series midway through the year, they traded away one of their star sluggers, Pedro Guerrero. Who did they get for him? And the answer, uh, John Cox's answer was the Dodgers got John Tudor from the St. Louis Cardinals for Pedro Guerrero. I remember being good with the, uh, with the trade at the time. He was okay for the stretch run. Didn't contribute a lot in the postseason. I think he got hurt. Yeah, it was a strange situation where going into the 1988 season, the the three biggest recognizable names on the team were Oral Hershiser, Pedro Guerrero, and Fernando Valenzuela. Now, the, uh, the Dodgers acquired Kirk Gibson in the offseason. They made a huge trade with the A's that brought in a bunch of uh, – uh, that – Cost them Bob Welch, but brought in Jay Howell, a couple other players, but and Jesse Orozco. Of course, Kirk Gibson put his thumbprint on the team uh, with winning the MVP, whether or not you think he deserved it. I think Oral Hershiser should have won the MVP as he had his remarkable season. Uh, But Fernando Valenzuela was hurt for the majority of the year and was not on the playoff roster. And Pedro Guerrero, who went into the year as their nominal MVP candidate was not very effective. I think he may have gotten into the doghouse at one point, but the Dodgers had needed pitching depth more than they needed Guerrero. And so they swapped Guerrero for John Tudor. That Dodger team, not only were they thin, they got riddled with injuries, not just Gibson. Sosha wound up getting hurt by the end. Mike Marshall wound up getting hurt by the end. Valenzuela couldn't play. And John Tudor walked off the mound. He was so hurt. He walked off the mound in the second inning of Game 3 of the World Series. I don't think that endeared him to a lot of Dodger fans, but the fact of the matter is uh, the man was hurt. Um, So, yes, you got that right. But, hey, uh, enough about the Dodgers. I was watching the game. I'm recording this on Saturday. I was watching the uh, Dodgers-Giants game the other day, and I saw that they were posting pictures of Orlando Cepeda. Uh, the Giants cast, and I wonder why are they doing that? And then I kind of put two and two together that they were, they were, they said we lost Orlando Cepeda. Orlando Cepeda died, and there's there's a sense to me the the timing of this is astonishing because it's right on the heels. We're still baseball is still mourning the death of Willie Mays. There's number twenty four patches everywhere, and 
now Cepeda is the second Giants legend that we've lost in the last few weeks. I mean, Hall of Fame all-time legend. No one is ever going to be bigger than Willie Mays, but Orlando Cepeda was a was a superstar. He was a tremendous player for the Giants and for several other teams. And he really represented in some ways the transition from New York to San Francisco and the new identity of the San Francisco Giants. Uh, Cepeda was a uh, was a prospect who, from Puerto Rico, came up through the New York Giants system, but he made his big league debut on opening day 1958, the first year there in San Francisco. So the very first San Francisco Giants game featured the very first appearance of Orlando Cepeda. He was a San Francisco Giant through and through. And that year brought about the emergence of Cepeda and Willie McCovey, who, believe it or not, Giants fans embraced Cepeda and McCovey more than they embraced Mays initially. Because they, I guess Giant fans in San Francisco felt that Mays was an imported superstar, but Cepeda and McCovey were their own. And also Mays, <clears throat> excuse me, um, constantly talked about his love of New York and how he missed New York. So for whatever reason, that didn't endear him to the fans right away. But then they endeared, he, he endeared him to by being the best player in baseball. But imagine a lineup that featured Mays, McCovey, Cepeda, three Hall of Famers at the heart of the lineup. McCovey offered protection for Mays. Cepeda offered protection for McCovey. Um, he had he put up great numbers. Uh, Cepeda was um, uh, Rookie of the Year when he came up. He wound up uh, in, in, in 1958. He batted 312. He had 25 home runs. And he was always among the home run leaders. He was always among the slugging percentage leaders. He was always among the uh, total base leaders. He was the runner-up for the National League in... 1961 and was a was a huge part of the Giants team that got to within a line drive by McCovey away from winning the World Series in 1962. The, the Giants had had a what seemed like a a fabulous problem and that is they had Hall of Famers up and down their lineup but Cepeda was a first baseman and McCovey was a first baseman, and they tried to figure out what to do with both of them. And the Giants eventually, when Cepeda had a, a little dip in his production, sent um, sent Cepeda packing, say that three times fast, to the Cardinals for Ray Sadecki in what, in retrospect, turned out to be one of the worst trades in the history of baseball because the Cardinals picked up Cepeda just in time for his best season. Cepeda won the MVP, finally. McCovey won the MVP, Mays won the MVP, and Cepeda won the MVP, but Cepeda won it as a Cardinal. And Cepeda won his lone World Series, the 1967 World Series, uh, against the Boston Red Sox. And he played for many years. Um, he was eventually traded for Joe Torrey, and was traded to the Atlanta Braves. And he initially was reticent to go to Atlanta because of he experienced a ton of racism in the minor leagues in the South, uh, not only as a dark-skinned man, but also as a Latino man. Um, but Hank Aaron assured him that he would fit in fine in Atlanta uh, he bounced around a little bit. He had a cup of coffee with the A's in 72 and then retired. And then in 73, the American League adopted the designated hitter and he signed with the Boston Red Sox to be their first ever DH. And he wound up being a DH also with the Kansas City Royals before packing it up. Now, in the mid 70s, he got into trouble for transporting marijuana, which seems so quaint now, but that really sullied, no 
pun intended with my name, his reputation, and probably initially cost him Hall of Fame votes. But Cepeda was eventually elected to the Hall of Fame in uh, 1999, and the Giants welcomed him back in the fold, and he has become one of those great ambassadors of Giants baseball. He, was, he had this great booming voice. He was this great outward personality, this gigantic hat he would always wear with his booming voice. And his the one of the great things about Oracle Park, I still want to call it Pac Bell Park, is they pay tribute to so many of their legends with the statues of them around. Cepeda has a statue around the stadium, but it's also it's McCovey's McCovey's Cove. I should I still think it should be called Bonds's Bay because Barry Bonds at the middle. But it was called the McCovey Cove in honor of William McCovey. The address is twenty four Willie Mays Plaza, and one of the places to get food. They have uh, uh, this sort of Caribbean uh, jerk beef sort of uh, 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 barbecue they have out there called the the Cha Cha Bowl. We can get the Cha Cha Bowl, as Orlando Cepeda's nickname was Cha Cha, and he's worth a salute. He became a positive uh, reminder of the glory days of the Giants' past. And there would be these great ceremonies for years where you'd have Willie Mays, Willie McCovey, Juan Marichal, and Orlando Cepeda, and Gaylord Perry all there. And now only Juan Marichal is left. What When we come back, I want to talk a little more about Cepeda's legacy and how we almost didn't have the great Hall of Fame career of Orlando Cepeda and some of the what-ifs of other people who almost went through what Cepeda went through. Let's hear a little bit from our friends over at Prize Picks. Are you aware of what Prize Picks is? Do you, if you've been listening to the show, I hope you've taken some notes of what Prize Picks truly is. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app. With over 5 million active members, PrizePix is the easiest and most exciting way to play fantasy sports. And unlike other apps, on PrizePix, it's just you against the numbers. All you have to do is pick more than or less than on two to six player stats projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on PrizePix with as little as four correct picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000. And with the finals over, do you want basketball action still going on? Women's basketball is still heating up. you got stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves alongside greats like Brianna Stewart. So you could win up to 100 times your cash watching them play ball. And PriceBooks is now available in more than 30 states across the country, including here in California, Texas, and in Georgia. Download the PrizePix app today and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code LOCKEDONMLB on PrizePix for a deposit match up to $100. PrizePix, pick more, pick less. Do you know what? In the end, it's really that easy. You know, we here at Locked On MLB, the entire staff here <clears throat> at Locked On MLB pride ourselves on giving you the latest info on baseball, the whole league, the deaths of legends, the drafts, everything going on. And it's a year-round thing. You got the Hall of Fame vote, you got trades in the off-season market. But you were also year-round collection seasons. Just because tax season is over doesn't mean the IRS will stop coming after you for unfiled taxes. The IRS can garnish your wages, levy your bank accounts, and seize your property. Don't let the IRS target you. Let the licensed professionals and tax expert at Tax Network USA go to bat for you. Look, I've worked for a lot of media companies and creative companies over the years, and sometimes they pay you with a personal check. Usually they don't take the taxes out. They give you a 1099. And let me tell you something. If you don't have people like the good folks at Tax Network USA on your side, come April 15th, you'll wake up and realize you owe piles of money and you can get in trouble. You need the People Tax Network USA on your side. With over 14 years of experience and an A-plus rating by the Better Business Bureau, Tax Network USA has saved clients over a billion dollars in tax debt. 
Whether you owe tax or have complicated matters like I had with those 1099s, or you finally hit it big with a parlay this season, you need to help file it correctly. Call 1-800-549-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash locked on. Locked on MLB is the place for you to check out Tax Network USA. And at checkout, mention Locked On, and you'll receive $250 discount off their services. Tax Network USA, they go to bat for you. Hey, let me ask you a question. Where is your hub for all of your sports takes, for all of your sports news? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories in sports. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channel app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I was uh, going over some biography information on Orlando Cepeda, and something struck me because it, it reminded me of an article I read earlier this year. Uh, Cepeda uh, grew up in Puerto Rico, and he was uh, he was the son of a beloved local player who played in the age of segregation. So because, I'm mean, not just because he was Puerto Rican, but because he was dark-skinned, he could not play in the major leagues. And his father, who was called the Bull, was a, a legendary local player. That was one of the reasons why Orlando Cepeda's nickname was Baby Bull, because he was the son of a great player. And Cepeda, when, when Cepeda turned of age and was becoming a teenager, uh, it was the mid-50s. So the segregation of the major leagues was over, but not everything was perfect. Not that anything will ever be perfect. I mean, for example, the Giants had Hank Thompson and Monty Irvin and Willie Mays on their team that won the pennant in 1951. They needed help at third base, and in their minor league system was Ray Dandridge, who may not have been in his prime, but was still a fine third baseman. If you don't know who Rain Dandridge is, he's in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was one of the great Negro League players of the 1940s. And the Giants had an unofficial quota. They would not call him up. We have enough black players. So instead of calling up a Hall of Famer, they didn't. And there were all sorts of, well, the mentality was the superstars would get called up, but role players and middle relievers and relief pitchers and everything like that, they had a very hard time getting any footing in the major leagues until the late 60s, or early 70s. That's just a fact. You can look it up. So Cepeda got his tryout with the New York Giants in 1955, and he wound up playing in... Uh, several uh you know several teams in the south and several teams in the minor leagues where he experienced a lot of jim crow laws and a ton of racism not just based upon the color of his skin but based on the fact that he had trouble speaking english it wasn't his native tongue and apparently according to him more than once he thought i'm done i don't want to do this this is too much. This The culture shock and being treated like a second-class citizen was too much. And he did stick it out, and he did make it to the major leagues. Now, keep in mind, one of his managers was Alvin Dark, who demanded that his Latin players didn't speak Spanish in the clubhouse and also spoke when he later managed the A's to Reggie Jackson about how, well, you know, black players don't need as much money as white players and openly was racist. This was the manager of the team who said, hey, you, Juan Marichal, Orlando Cepeda, you know, my Hall of Famers, stop speaking Spanish. This was the environment that he played in. And the fact that he persevered and made it through is a great 
source of inspiration. But why did he have to persevere? I mean, when people had trouble with what Reggie was saying about his time in the 1960s, like, oh, that happened a long time ago. First of all, it didn't happen a long time ago. It happened within his lifetime. He's still alive. It's not that long ago. But also, when we look at players and we look at people's legacy, can't help but think one of the great tragedies of segregation was the great players we missed. Like, oh, I don't know, Orlando Cepeda's father. This could have been a Ken Griffey Sr., Ken Griffey Jr. situation. Or, hmm, is there a situation in the Giants where there was a father and son? Let me think. Bonds? Hell, the Aloos. What other players do we not hear about who never, who never got the chance? Or who did get the chance, but the culture shock of the racism forced them away? Have you ever heard of Hector Espino? MLB.com had a wonderful article about Hector Espino, who had a 25-year career. And he wound up hitting, you know, the, the, the records of some of the leagues that he played in in Mexico and some of the the uh, uh, the the leagues he played in the Caribbean are not always the most reliable in terms of writing down the stats that they had, or at least having or, or access to them. But the guy hit well, recorded well over three hundred some odd home runs over the years, and there are entire years where there's no record at all. So he probably hit closer to four hundred, or maybe even five hundred. Some people quote he hit up to 780 home runs when you combine all of his stats. Either way, he was he was called the Mexican Babe Ruth. And he played how much did how many times did he play within the confines of Major League Baseball? Zero games. How about within what was called uh, what was called organized ball, meaning that's what it was called back then. The American League, National League, and their minor league affiliates. A grand total of 32 games. In 1964, 25 year old Hector Espino played for Jacksonville, which was part of the St. Louis Cardinals organization. He played 32 games, hit three homers, he batted over 300, and he did not like, he had culture shock playing in Northern Florida in the mid 1960s which was probably not a very fun play because Northern Florida is basically the South and the mid sixties was not a good time to be someone not from America earning their living. And he said, no, I'm out. He, he, it was, he had, according to the article, uh, I was on MLB.com and a great article by uh, Callum Houston on the mop up duty uh, blog. I'm going to quote that, that he had great success, but the culture shock, homesickness, and the prevalent racism made him decide to go back to Mexico, where he remained a superstar, hitting 30 home runs this year, 37 home runs this year, batting 380 this year, batting 360 this year. He could Would he have been a superstar in America? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But he was in the Cardinal organization. In the 60s, if he had made it up to the major leagues and as a first baseman or an outfielder, he would have been alongside Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, and yeah, Orlando Cepeda. If he had made it up there and had some of them take him under their wing, Hector Espino might be one of those celebrated players in St. Louis instead of this figure of Mexican legend. This is the great tragedy of segregation in so many ways, is not just the lack of social justice, but what would have been the Hector Espino game? And how many times would he have driven in Lou Brock and Cepeda in front of him? I don't know, and you don't know. But let's celebrate people, and let's wonder what could have been but with the death of Orlando Cepeda, it brings up something, which is we're losing a lot of players from a certain era. So let's honor some people 
while they're still alive. All right. It's time to talk to our friends over at FanDuel. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of what FanDuel is. FanDuel is a place for people like me. I love sports. I love when you got lots of sports going on. You got the you had the Stanley Cup finals, which were great. The Celtics won. That was terrific. But now we're getting fewer games, even though the Olympics are starting to bubble up. Do you what? FanDuel helps me get my love of sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And during this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a daily bonus. That's right. There's something for everybody. Whatever your sport is, whoever your players are, dream up those bets and head on over to FanDuel every day, all summer long. Head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel is the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. FanDuel. Let's make some bets. Hey, uh, this is a reminder that Locked On has started the first ever national sports streaming channel that is available on YouTube. And it's now also available on the free Fire TV channel app on the Amazon Fire TV. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the Free Fire TV channel app. I know how the In Memoriam video is going to end this year with uh, Cepeda and Willie Mays. Uh, You're not going to be able to top that in terms of breaking out the tears. And even if someone huge also dies, you can I can seamlessly go from a clip of Orlando Cepeda to Willie Mays. That's I got to think ahead there. But instead of waiting, one of the things I liked about the game in Birmingham was that we were going to honor Willie Mays while he was still alive, but Willie spoiled that by dying. Um, and now we've lost Cha-Cha. And I mentioned when you'd have those celebrations with McCovey and Gaylord Perry and Orlando Cepeda and Willie Mays, you know, McCovey, and all of them would be out there. Marichal is the only one left. And Marichal is not a young man. And so when I stop and think about who are some of the oldest Hall of Famers who are still, you know, who are still with us, uh, you know, Marichal is one of them. You know, and, you know, we're, I'm just thinking about who are some of the other ones. And Koufax, Koufax is going to be 89 pretty soon. Sandy Koufax is still with us. Let's honor Sandy Koufax and everything he meant, he meant of the Brooklyn-born pitcher who became the superstar of the Los Angeles Dodgers. What better symbolism of Dodger history than Koufax? And the sort of, I don't know, the aura that he has, the fact that he was still in his prime when he retired. So you wonder what would have happened if he kept going. Well, what probably would have happened. He would have damaged his arm forever. So that's the reason why he left. But yeah, we gotta let's let's honor. Let's honor the memory of Sandy Koufax and the oldest living Hall of Famer, the 90-year-old Luis Aparicio. Luis Aparicio, who was the first major superstar from Venezuela. And he was part of the White Sox team that won the American League pennant in 1959 and then helped lead the Orioles alongside Brooks Robinson. Man, can you imagine the defense on that side of the infield having Brooks Robinson and Luis Aparicio, the man that Ted Williams said was the greatest shortstop he ever saw? He's still with us, Oriole fan, White Sox fans, hell, Red Sox fans, who had Aparicio for about a second. Uh, Honor the man. Let's honor Bill Mazeroski. When not just for his home run, but for his great defense and being a great leader on one of the tremendous teams in baseball history, where they had the trio of future Hall of Famers of Roberto Clemente, Willie Stargell, and Bill Mazeroski 
in the team that really was a pioneer racially. It was the first team that fielded an all-black or Latino starting nine, and they had a three-headed future Hall of Fame leadership on the team. An African-American, a white man, and a Latino man, Clemente, Stargell, and Mazeroski. That was a big reason why they played so well. They had leaders, no matter who you were, no matter what your background is, we're all working together. We all have leaders on here, and we're all going to finish together, and they did so in that 71 team. And he is the only one of that group who's still with us. Let's honor him, shall we? You know, Juan Marichal. Juan Marichal and Sandy Koufax were one of the great one-two punches in terms of baseball pitching legends. No pitcher won more games in the 1960s than Juan Marichal. And he was just a dominant pitcher for the Giants during that great stretch. So let's not wait until we lose them. Let's salute them while we have the chance. And until we can do that, I want to say rest in peace, Orlando Cepeda, cha-cha. We saw the baby bull. If only we saw the bull. And may you rest in peace. I'm glad that you made through the decision to play in the major leagues. And for the late Hector Espino, I wish we got to see you play as well. So here's a trivia question. We talked a lot about Hall of Famers and the Giants. There have been several Hall of Famers who have played for both the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's. There are a couple of Hall of Famers, both. Uh, 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 Orlando Cepeda is one of them because he played briefly with the Oakland A's. Who is the only pitcher in the Hall of Fame currently who played with both the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's? Who's the only pitcher whose Hall of Fame plaque says San Francisco and Oakland amongst other teams? That's your trivia question for today. So put it down here at Lockdown and Milby Pods on Twitter and Instagram. I'm your pal Sully with Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Paying tribute to the late Cha-Cha, Orlando Cepeda. This has been Locked On MLB. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.